a startup in San Francisco. Um, I'll, be, I'll be presenting tonight uh, a platform that we've been developing for quite some time uh, that's called TG, and that is targeting at building big data applications. Um, and we started open sourcing this platform a couple of months ago. Um, so big data applications, um, that means a couple of things. First, you want to potentially collect, collect a lot of data. Uh, you, you want to use that data to um, infer new data. Uh, uh, typically, personalization, for detections, or other things like this. Um, that means processing big amount of data. You know, you can use actually MapReduce using Hadoop. Um, and last, when you have a big data application, you probably want to serve that data and you probably have some real-time constraints. That means uh, serving data online. Um, typically, a user interacts with your website. Uh, you want to record that information right away and you want to in uh, integrate this information right away for new recommendations, uh, taking into account what the user just did, not what he did like a week ago or a day ago. Um, building big data application is actually notoriously hard. Um, most of the infrastructure that's available right now, um, like large-scale NoSQL databases, um, they have some drawbacks. Typically, they're byte-oriented, which makes it very easy for users to shoot themselves in the feet by just um, destroying their data and not being able to recover the data they stored. Uh, because they have to manage the bytes, and bytes is kind of abstract, and you have to do a lot of management. More? Okay. Um, the second aspect of big data applications that make this hard for developers is uh, designing schemas or layouts. How do you organize your data so that you can actually process the data in the way you want that scales to billions of rows or billions of cells? It's pretty hard. Um, and so if you don't design things correctly in the first shot, it's going to be very hard to adjust later because you will have accumulated already billions of rows and you will not be able to rewrite easily all of those rows into a different schema or different layouts. Um, and so uh, one of the consequences of this is integration with MapReduce is generally difficult. Um, and so in building KG, we are trying to, yeah? So are you going to talk more about the schema design later? Um, I can explain in that area if you want. Uh, I, Actually, by the way, how many of you know about HBase in details, or how many of you are actually using HBase right now? Uh, okay, well, let me know if I'm going too slow or too, too fast in some details, and feel free to interrupt me for details. Uh, for now, I'll just stick to the basics, and if, we want, if you want, we can talk later after uh, the presentation. Um, so in this talk, actually, I will give you some high-level design decisions we made in Kiji uh, on how to improve the current situation. Um, then I will give you some overview of the data model that we're dealing with and how we manage schemas and layouts. I'll give you a couple of examples on how we read and how we write data in Kiji. Um, how to integrate Kiji with MapReduce, that means how do you actually write MapReduce um, on top of Kiji. And potentially if you have time or if you're interested I can give you a brief demo. Um, and finally I'll go over a conclusion. Um, so the goals of Kiji itself is basically uh, facilitate the developer's role in building big data applications. That means um, avoiding a couple of pitfalls that software engineers can easily go into when they start designing an application, not thinking about what happens if you suddenly have like 10 times or 100 times more data. Um, or what happens in two years when you realize that suddenly the model you've been working with is not enough and you need to expand it and add some more data and now you need to include all this new data with your model. Um, that potentially means a lot of work, a lot of uh, additional tasks to modify the data you already accumulated and does not necessarily fit to, already, to what you want to do. Um, one of the focus, uh, the common goals that we had is making the common case easy. Um, that means making reasonable standardized design decisions regarding lower level systems. And finally, we didn't want you to bundle everything together, so KG itself is a bundle, it, as a set of components, you can use whatever you need and drop whatever you don't want to use. Um, um, <coughs> a brief look at KG components right now. So under the hood, we are actually building on top of Hadoop, MapReduce, HDFS, and HBase. Um, on top of this, we built KG Schema, which is a management layer that allows you to manage an HBase collection of tables. 
Um, on top of which we build a MapReduce library, uh, which also includes, uh, so the KG MapReduce itself is a framework that allows you to interact with MapReduce and KG. And on top of this, we also open source another library for KG MapReduce programs that you can use um, straight in other applications. That includes typically um, training a uh, machine learning algorithm or extracting data from some <coughs> other data set or bulk importing from JSON or XML or all these kind of things that you should supposedly be able to use. And there are a couple of schema tools and on top of this you can use whatever you need to build user applications. And the whole of this is called Kiji Bento Box. Um, so, as I showed previously, the leading design decision, we are basically storing all of the data in HBase. Uh, HBase in itself is very flexible. Um, it basically is a store for byte arrays, and it's up to you to determine what the byte arrays are. Um, so that's very flexible, and that's also very easy for you to shoot yourself if you're not very careful. Um, so on top of this, we made a decision to use Avro. Avro is a serialization mechanism, uh, pretty much like protocol buffers or Thrift. Um, Avro is actually a very good candidate for us because it allows you to evolve your data over time um, very flexibly. Um, we can talk later about that, but if you have like specific constraints about forward compatibility or backward compatibility, that actually restricts the kind of evolution you can do. Uh, since we are building on top of HBase, we're actually building tables, and that means we're actually building an entity-centric table design. That means your tables will be containing entities, and each entity is actually backed by one, H, one row in, H, in an H table. Um, and so, KG itself is basically a dictionary of data that is organized into tables. Um, well, that's just words, actually. <clears throat> One other feature is we want to be able to distribute writes, writes uh, uh, across cluster. Uh, if you have a bunch of writes, uh, ideally, you should not have one hotspot where you actually hit only one server that takes all of the writes. Um, if you want to study of these kind of things, OpenTSDB is a really, really good example where they had to design complex uh, composite row keys to avoid writing to only one region servers. And so they, there's a pretty good documentation on how they actually des design row keys. Uh, in PG, we basically made a decision to prefix all the row keys by a hash of the row themselves. Yes? Uh, so about entity-centric table design, uh, do you have any support uh, because uh, for instance, if you consider the normal Java world, the uh, object have hierarchical structure. So there is object, a member of this object, another object, member of this object, object another object. So <coughs> it's, uh, there are several approaches in HBase world, world to, to present it in, in flat structures of HBase. Uh, well, of course, Avro could help you to some extent, but do you have any kind of specific support for uh, trans transferring hierarchical structure into flat structure? Um, so when you actually design your table, you should you have to make a conscious choice whether you want to store a single Avro record in one column, or if you want to expand this in different column. That will actually affect your ability later on to either update one specific part of the record, or just read that from the disk. Or if you have a single record, that means you will necessarily write the entire record all the time if you want to add one field or mutate one field. <coughs> and you have to read it back with the rest of the record as well and decode it. So at that point, it's basically a, an engineered decision to decide what should go in columns or in records uh, because I cannot infer that from just the record. It depends on the read and write patterns that we intend. Um, let's say you have a list of entries like URLs. You probably want to append a lot of data to this and so that probably should not belong to a record because the record will grow bigger and bigger and you will have to rewrite it every time. So you probably should use something else where a single URL is one more data cell that you keep appending to the edge table and not a growing record. Does that actually make sense? Yeah, of course, but it's kind of uh, design, uh, kind of, uh, there, there's no kind of support of framework for this, right? It's, it's just um, pure, pure kind of uh, on, on taste of designer or architect, but not, not part of framework, right? <coughs> So for now, we are providing the equivalent of a generic API, which means uh, you have to do some amount of work on your own. There, if, if that's what you ask, there is no generation of classes that makes it very easy for you right now. Uh, as a hint, it might come in the future. And if you really want it, you can send us a patch or file an issue on the public Java. Uh, but that's clearly on our radar right now. Um, I cannot tell more about that right now. Uh, 
Um, right, so coming back to this, if you want to distribute writes across the cluster or read in the same way, basically one strategy is to prefix all the row keys by hashes that will actually target all the rows randomly or supposedly fairly across the nodes in your cluster. And that's what we call, that's what we name hash prefix row keys. Um, and so QG makes this default things for you. Uh, if you want, can override, override it. Um, why did we choose HBase? Um, HBase is very well integrated in the Hadoop stack. Um, HBase is also very scalable, like Facebook is using it at Scalio as well. Uh, and arguably, the table or schema data structure is actually much more powerful than a pure key value store um, that you can store as HDFS files. There is a bunch of data management that you get from using HTable over HDFS. In HDFS, if you give me a file, I have no idea what's in there. You have to give me the file and a description <coughs> separate from the file that tells me what I'm supposed to find in the panel. Uh, if you have a table, you have already a lot of metadata around the data that helps you to understand what's in there. Um, why do you choose Avro? Uh, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, primarily for schema evolution purposes. Um, if you write a record today, it's very likely you might want to extend it or modify it in a couple of years because you realize that suddenly you need to store more about your entities, whether it's user, companies, or products. And so with Avro, you can easily extend existing record and add more fields or deprecate fields, remove fields, um, expand the types of the records. Um, Avro is also pretty nice because it allows to serialize your data structures pretty in a compact way uh, over the wire. Um, it also provides a rich set of data types, like pretty much everything you want to use, you will find it in Avro, um, and the list is actually growing. And it has also a decent API. Uh, if you want to write user-specific API, that means like end user where you don't care about generic frameworks, you can actually use Avro as is, uh, and use specific records that are actually compiled and tailored for what you need. So then once you return your record definition, you will compile it to specific custom classes that makes it easy for you to use. Um, but you also have like a generic API that means if you want to write um, a framework that works on objects that you don't know in advance, you can actually do that. Um, and finally, Avro is also well integrated with the Hadoop world. Um, especially you can find a bunch of input and output formats to work with Avro records in MapReduces. The trade-offs we made for entity-centric applications are um, the following. So basically, you will have, or if you want to use this kind of a platform, it means you want to have a bunch of entities, like potentially millions, billions of rows. If your application has only one or two rows or 10 rows, you probably not, you, d you probably don't need an age base or this kind of data structures. Um, Reason for that is basically you want to write or to spread your writes over all of the rows and you want to also spread your reads over all of the rows. So if you have only one or two rows, it doesn't make sense to use an H table. Um, I can go more detail into this, but um, the last example, poor choice for high update rates is exactly what, what a OpenTS DB is about. If you don't design your row keys carefully, writing a bunch of data is going to be a pain. So the major features, uh, we want to support big amount of data, as I said, up to billions of rows. We want rich data types, which is why we choose Avro. Uh, with data schema evolutions, that means your ability to expand your records and your data over time without using all of the data you wrote previously. Um, we want to help people write row keys in a way they can expand them later. Uh, that means designing your row key properly. Uh, designing your row keys is actually critical, when, uh, critical. As soon as you design your row keys, you cannot really change them unless you rewrite your tables entirely. So if you make a wrong choice initially, you will pay it later. Uh, we need integration with HBase and MapReduce, and we want a framework level metadata service. That means the ability to write generic algorithms, uh, typically machine learning programs or Um, so I'm going right now into the details of the data model for Kiji. Um, conceptually, the Kiji data store is a queue. Um, the first dimension is like the rows. 
the second dimension is like the columns, and then you have timestamps, versions of your data that you can write over time. Um, so as you write data, typically, if I'm collecting the user, the, the URLs the web uh, user is, go, is consulting, I'll probably write a bunch of URLs over time, and I'll collect more data, and then I, I still want to keep the versions of all the URLs he, he visited before. Um, and so on that slide, you can see like first, we have like three column families, the blue, the red, and the gray. The blue one is named info, and it contains four smaller columns, or group type column. Um, info name, info email, info web hits. Um, column families are just a logical concept. They are actually not physically backed by any property. Uh, they just means like I have a group of families and they belong together. Especially here, like I have a bunch of comic, uh, columns that actually are info about the user. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, locality groups. Locality groups are actually physically materialized. Whatever belongs in one locality group is actually stored in the same files uh, in an edge base. And that means like whenever you write them or whenever you read them, you read them together. And that means you have like some atomic properties on these on the columns that belong to the same locality group. Um, so here in this example, there is a locality group called default that contains the column family info and the column family ga games, which means whenever I want to update or read data from these two column families, I'll get some more uh, atomic properties. Uh, there is a second column family that is called in memory, uh, which means the columns in this locality group will be pinned in memory for faster access. Um, and that means also whatever update I make to this, this column will not necessarily go atomically with the updates I make in the other columns. Um, right, so here I'm just showing that for a single column you can have multiple versions of the content of the cell um, indexed by a timestamp. The timestamps is actually used by uh, HBase under the hood. You can have a couple of properties, like I want to retain the last three versions of a cell, which means if you put more data in there, you will actually lose the old one. You can retain as much as you want. You can have time to time to leave operations. That means I want to keep only the three month um, worth of data, which means whatever is older than three months will be silently discarded over time. Um, Yep. Could you please sometimes uh, give a kind of hint what are um, specific features of your framework? Because part of this just basic which was functionality, right? So it's yep. kind of a little bit hard to, to, to make a difference when what actually this key tree is added. Uh, sure. Uh, so what we call a locality group is actually an age based family. Uh, we, a KG family does not, is not materialized in HBase in itself. Uh, it's mostly a logical concept, as I said before. And so, actually, you will get details in a couple of slides. Um, we have two types of uh, column families. Um, a column itself is associated with a schema, an Avro schema, which means all of the cells in that column will have this Avro schema. And so that means whenever you write it or whenever we read it, you read it. Uh, we will be checking with the schema if your data is actually valid, which means we will we are moving away from the byte arrays of HBase, and now what you see is like a store of Avro, Avro records, and not a store of uh, byte arrays. Uh, if you interact with HBase itself, your row keys are byte arrays, your columns are byte arrays, your data is byte array. Um, in Kiji, you interact with uh, high-level data structures and essentially um, composite keys. Um, real column names like strings or identifiers and other records. Um, so, but that's coming in the next. So here's a snippet like, this is the DDL description for the column and that says there's a column named info colon email. Uh, info is the column family and email is the qualifier name for the column. And the schema for that column is actually a string, which means this is an Avro string, UTF-8 encoded. Uh, and that means every cell in every row in that column will be encoded as a string right now. Uh, and if you try to write something else, the QG layer will actually shout at you that you're not actually writing a string. And if you try to decode something that is not a string, that's probably, that's probably meaning that you have a bad problem in your page base, like you corrupted some data somehow or something like that. Uh, 
uh, but if you use Kiji consistently, you should never end up in this situation. Um, just to distinguish between two terms, um, traditionally schema is like the description of the layout of a table in relational databases. Uh, in Kiji, schema is mostly associated with uh, Avro layout, Avro schemas because that's what Avro calls a schema. Uh, and for a table, we use the name layout. Uh, that's all what this slide is about. Um, so that's actually what I was saying before. Every single column will have an Avro reader schema. You can write using different writer schema, uh, provided your schema is actually compatible with the reader schema, that should be fine, because that means whatever you write, you will still be able to read it with uh, the reader schema that is declared. Um, columns families is just a logical namespace for qualifiers. You can have as many qualifiers and as, as many columns that you want. Uh, normally, when you write to a family that is named uh, info column in a, uh, email, that will actually take that much bytes in HBase. Like the column, the, the column names will be copied uh, straight into the H files. Uh, Kiji is actually translating this into more compact names uh, that are like basically binary representation of the names. So we keep an index. And so it's very likely that if you have this column name, uh, info name, we'll store it as B colon C or something that is more compact just to save some space. Uh, if you use some compaction, that might actually not be very useful, but in most cases, it's actually useful on the wire uh, when you actually interact with the region servers after it's been decoded. Um, yeah, additionally, any column family is physically stored in a single logical group, which is which maps to an eight base column family. Um, so there are two types of column families. There are group type families, which are basically just a group of a uh, single family and uh, single columns. And each column can have a different type. So if you have info, column email, info, column name, that they can be strings. Uh, if you have info, column age, that can be an int. Uh, there is another type of families which is called map type family, uh, which means you didn't declare any qualifier name. You know, for example, that I have like the history of my user, and the history is actually a prefix for any URL that you, the user visited. And so I will have like a column that is history colon www.google.com, and that's, that column specifically will contain all of the history for the browsing history of my user that went on google.com. Um, and so that means basically you can dynamically create new qualifiers. Um, all of them will have actually a single data type, so to, to ensure that you have consistency in that column family. Um, the way to define a table in PG is using uh, a table layout, which is internally represented as a number record itself stored in a QG meta table. Um, as I mentioned before, the columns are actually internally mapped into compact names. So if you have info colon name, that will probably be mapped to something like B colon C or B colon D, depending on your table layout and the history of, it, of the layout of the table. Um, the layout itself is not immutable. You can add columns, remove columns, update the column types, or update the column properties. Um, a layout update can be applied in two different ways. There is an internal Avro JSON representation you can use to declare or to define an update to the layout. Um, or you can use the TPL tool that we wrote on top of that to make it slightly more friendly. Um, this is an example of the DDL that you're using to describe tables. Um, can you actually read that or is it big enough? Uh, so this one describes a table named user uh, there's a description. You can specify the type of the row keys that you want to use. In, in this case, we're just saying that we want, we want to use hash prefix keys, and the hash prefix should be two bytes. That means four X digits in front of the key. Um, so that means like if you write a, a column with an entity ID that is uh, first name dot last name, physically in the edge base, you will have a hash of the string first name dot last name, and then you have first name and last name encoded after the hash. Um, we encode the key itself after the, the hash just to make sure that you can retrieve the, 
the row key from the data. Previously, we used to store only the hash, but that means you potentially have collisions and you lose the, the row keys. It's kind of not ideal. Um, in this table, there is only one locality group called default. Uh, the properties for the locality groups are we store all of the versions of the cells forever. The data is not stored in memory. It's compressed on disk using gzip. And in that locality group, there is only one family named info that contains two columns, one name, one email, and they are both strings. Uh, so that's actually pretty, com that's very familiar if you're using SQL already, that's pretty much like it. Um, we support four types of row keys. There is hashed, that's what I was mentioning before. That's, you give, a, you give me a row key, I will just compute a hash and that's what I will use, which means I lose the row key. Uh, there might be a couple of cases where you want to do this so that you can actually not retrieve the entity IDs from the table itself, uh, maybe for some security purpose or something. Uh, but most, most often you will probably want to use something that is hash prefixed just to ensure that your data is actually properly distributed over all of your region servers. Um, if you have specific needs you, needs, you can use row, which means it's user managed bytes. You do whatever you want with the HBase keys. And finally, we just recently introduced composite hierarchical uh, keys. Um, composite row keys are slightly better, in my, in my opinion. Uh, they, al they, allow you to they allow you to have multiple components in the key. So one typical example is your, your clients are actually companies that actually sell products. And so your key, you want to encode in the key the company ID and the product ID. And so one way to do this is to have like the first component being the company ID and the second component of the key being the entity ID. That means you can actually retrieve all the products uh, for one company by doing a scan over just the prefix that is the company ID. Um, feature of the, of the company composite key, uh, the leading components are actually hash prefixed. You can control how many components you want to include in the hash. And the trailing components are actually, you can scan over the trailing components. Uh, that means you keep the ordering. Um, and finally, we support string, int, and long, and potentially nullable components. Um, that means you can have components that are typically entertainment, Xbox 360, or CA, and I'm fine. Um, I'm just now going over a couple of code snippets just to give you a taste of what it looks like. Um, so if you want to work with a QG table, all you have to do is know the, the entry point for the QG instance you want to work with, which is <laughs> called a QG URI. The QG URI will describe the HBase base cluster you want to interact with, and potentially the QG instance name, and potentially the QG table name, and potentially columns as well if you want. It's all a hierarchical URI. So, if you give me a KGRI, I can open the KG instance by just <coughs> using a factory and gen from the from the KG instance, I can open a table. And once you're done with it, you can just release both. Um, if you want to write data, all you have to do is, from the table, acquire a writer, and the writer will be aware of all of the layout of your table and will allow you to write data according to the schema you've declared. Um, that means here, I get a table, I open the writer, from the table, I can get, I can construct an entity ID uh, based on the for, uh, on the layout of the entity ID. In this case, this assumes that you have a component, um, a row key format that actually includes two components: the, the last name and the first name of some person. And then you can write some information using that. Uh, the writer uh, user is the entity ID. I'm writing to the column family named info and the column qualifier named age. Optionally, I can specify a timestamp if I want to control the timestamps. If you want, if you don't want to control the timestamps, by default you will get the latest one. That's the age based default. But, yeah. And in that case, age is uh, assumed to be, for example, an int. And if that's not an int, you will get a you will get an error at that point. Once you're done, you can free the log writer. Reading data is so. Yeah. Reading data is pretty much symmetrical to this. You get from the table, you can get a reader. Um, then you have to assemble a data request that explain what part of the data you are actually intending to read. Uh, the reason for this is whenever you read, you probably don't want to read the entire row, but you, you, it's very likely that you want to, to focus on just a couple of columns. Um, 
And so the data request allows you to be specific about what you want, uh, which families you want to retrieve, how much of each family you want to retrieve, how many versions you want per column. Um, and so here I'm just expressing that I want to request all of the data from the column info column age, which means if there is some other columns in a row, I will not actually fetch that data from the region servers. That will actually minimize the amount of data you transfer from the region servers to your client. Um, and then from the reader, I, I send a get request with the, with the specific entity ID, potentially the one I, I used earlier, and with the specific data request. And what I get from this is a key zero data. The key zero data contains the entire data you've specified you're interested with. And from there, you can actually access the data in the row uh, using typically row.getMost recent value. Uh, if you've requested more data, you can, you can specify, uh, you can use different accessors method that will allow you to access all of the versions with the timestamps and uh, more. Uh, and when you're done with this, you can actually close the reader. Um, one not noticeable difference here between the reader and the writer, the writer allows you to write any entity ID uh, in the same way. When I do writer the put, I can specify an entity ID, I can specify a column and the data. When I do a get, uh, the get API is more focused on the row because it's more likely that you want to work on one row uh, specifically and then move to a different row. So here, the key row data is actually a reader, a row-centric reader API. Moving on the MapReduce API, we recently released uh, candidates for a QG MapReduce library. Um, this library includes a number of MapReduce patterns that we use to read from a table, write, from, write to a table, and combination of these. Um, a typical example is a producer. A producer is actually a function that you want to apply on each single row. Um, so it's a function that is reading a row and generating new content for that specific row with just the data from that row. Uh, so in that example, that means you probably want to request all the information in info, web hits, and games. And from that, you want to derive some information and write that back to the row right away. <clears throat> um, that's typically what you want to use if you want to generate new recommendations for um, some users or some other. Um, a gatherer is another example that reads from a table and emits key value pairs to HDFS files or back to a table as well. Um, you would use a gatherer if you want to train a classifier or some machine learning algorithm. Bulk importers are just the opposite of gatherers. They allow you to import data from external data sources into a table. Uh, one major challenge when you want to import data into an HBase is writing to HBase directly is pretty hard because if you write a bunch of data, you will actually hammer your H tables, your region servers, and at some point they will actually go into uh, compaction mode. And potentially what might happen is your region servers go down for compaction while you're trying to insert more data. And so it's possible that in some cases you might actually shut down your entire cluster just writing too much data. So if you don't do this carefully enough, you might actually take your cluster down. Um, that happened a couple of times. And so one way around this is using H files directly. And so we have a couple of bulk importers that allow you to ingest a bunch of external data, uh, a bunch of data from external data sources and generate H files. H files are the data store files used internally by the region server of H tables. Um, by writing H files, we are able to generate a lot of data for consumption by an H table and nearly atomically insert that data in a table without, ha without requiring a, a high load on the region servers. So that means you will run a MapReduce that will ingest your external data uh, and emit H files. The H files are actually processed in a way that makes them easy for region servers to use. Uh, in particular, all of the cells are actually already sorted in a, an H file. And that makes it very easy for region server to bulk load a new H file and just overlay on top of the existing cells in the table. Um, and once you've generated your H files, you can bulk load them into the H table. Um, 
So we're providing, providing an API for bulk importers. Uh, we're also providing a bunch of stock importers for CSV, JSON, Hadoop logs, and we're adding more right now. Um, Orthogonally to this, um, any of the MapReduce abstraction we use can also benefit from something that we call key value store. Um, key value store is an abstraction for map side joins. Uh, it's an external data store that you can use to do lookups while running MapReduce uh, to combine with the, the rows you're actually processing. Uh, so typically in a MapReduce, uh, you would declare that you want to use some key value store that can be backed by another H table or by a file on HDFS. And you require this key value store from the mapper. And then you can get a reader and just extract one value associated to one key. Um, and this one typical example is you generate, a, you generate this key value store in a separate MapReduce. You've extracted some features or some aggregated data on your users or your database. And so now you have like some globally computed state on your database. And now you can rerun another MapReduce on your entire data set using this as a data store, uh, as a key value store. That's a way to achieve a uh, upside job. So, excuse me, so this store object is completely in memory, right? Say it again? This store object will be completely in uh, memory. memory. Um, no, it's actually, so as I said, it can be backed by an H table, which means every time you want to access a key, if it's not in the cache, it will just be fetched from the, the H table directly. The assumption is like you don't want to access all of the key value store. Uh, potentially you want, if your key value store is small enough, it can probably fit in RAM. But... Um, well, I'm actually done here. So if you want to try it, you can go on http Um we have demo, we have a demo called the Bento Box. You can download it and in a couple of minutes you can set up a mini cluster to play with. Um, I can give you a short demo right now if you're interested in that uh, with a couple of comments uh, or I'm ready to take questions. I'd be interested in a demo. Okay. Um, all right. Is that big enough? My bento box is right now here. It's just a tar zip archive. You can download it from the website, uh, or you can build it yourself. Uh, everything is open source. Everything is on GitHub. Uh, we have a public Jira. We have a public mailing lists. Uh, it's getting some traction right now, which is pretty cool. Um, and so you can download that. So I'm just extracting the entire archive. From there, uh, all you have to do to set up your entire environment is source an environment file, and then you can start Bento. That will take a couple of minutes, uh, because it starts an entire MapReduce cluster, HDFS cluster, and HBase cluster in memory. For now, we are using HTML APIs straight. There is a feature right now being worked on uh, conjunct, uh, in conjunction with um, rate relevance, where we are trying to build an asynchronous uh, API. There is an asynchronous API for HTML, for HBase, which is supposedly faster or more efficient. And we have, fe uh, we have a feature request to implement a writer based on this uh, API. Have, have you guys looked at using async HBase on StumbleFound created? Yes, that's exactly the one we were talking about. Oh, that is, okay. Yeah. And then are the, uh, are the hashing algorithms pluggable? Yes. Um, so you can write your own and plug it in. So right. Before that, you listen to us, our stock, I assume. 
right now we're using MD5 because we don't like we don't have any concrete use case for more security or collision things. Like the, the risk of collision is pretty low already. Uh, if you're work, if you're worried about someone trying to do, I don't know, uh, injections of some data, it's probably you probably have different problems to focus on. Yeah, no, I would, I would be looking more specifically at like um, taking low order bytes and moving them to the front as mm -hmm. opposed to hashing for speed. Oh. Yeah, so the entire internal infrastructure for building raw keys is, is pluggable. Um, if, you're, if you're actually interested in this thing, you can easily file a request and implement, a, implement it in a patch. That should be fairly small, actually. Um, Christoph, we did this first part. What did you say you were doing with Bridge Relevance? Hmm? You said you were doing something with Bridge Relevance. Oh, we were talking with people at Bridge Relevance to implement um, <coughs> A QG writer API on uh, implementation on top of async uh, writes. Um, so, the MapReduce cluster and the HBase cluster is ready right now. Um, so, you have all the details here like the Zookeeper quorum is actually running on port 20, 2181. The MapReduce cluster is using the default ports 8020, 8021, and you have all of the dashboards here. Uh, So my MapReduce cluster is currently working. And so everything looks good. I have only one region server, which is fine. Um, so right now I can just use Kiji in the, in the shell that I started. Um, so the first thing you want to do probably is to install a Kiji. Or for now I can just list the Kiji instances that I know about. Uh, for now, and what it will tell me is like, no, there is no default instance in installed. Um, you can specify your entire HBase cluster to list all of the Kiji instances in the cluster and right now, oops. <coughs> right, and in the in my entire HBase cluster there is no Kiji instance installed. So I can just install one. <coughs> Instances back to make sure. <coughs> so I see my instance. I can install another one. Right, and now I have two instances. So now I can create a table in one of these instances. Um, for that, I might choose. This is the layout I'm using right now just for a demo. Um, I'm creating a table user that has uh, one locality group and two columns, one that is name and one that is email. Uh, both are strings. Uh, I don't have any other record here to play with, uh, but that's easy to add later. <coughs> so I'll actually create that table. For this, I'm using the schema shell that is actually understanding the data description language that I presented earlier. Um, so now I created the table. Uh, oops. Um, so if I'm listing the content of the default KG instance, now I can see that I have a table named user. Um, I can look at the layout. This is actually the JSON representation of the table layout. It's actually more verbose because it's an Avro record. And what it says is like I have a, a row key formatted uh, entity ID that is using a hash with the sold size of two bytes. 
and the component in that table is a key that has uh, one string. I have only one layout, one locality group, and those are actually integers that mention that I want to retain all of the versions in a cell, and I don't want to discard any cell even if it's getting old. Uh, I'm using JZIP to encode my data, and then I have like two families. One of them is, uh, no, I have only one family, named info, which has two columns, one that is name and then one that is ename. And they all store strings. Um, I can use the QG schema shell also to do the same thing, uh, but it's a little bit more friendly. <coughs> so it's pretty much like a SQL-like environment. So here I'm just showing the tables in my default instance, and there's only one table called users. Um, I can also describe my table. And all it tells me is uh, my row key contains a key that is a string and cannot be null. And I have one column family and the same thing. Um, from the shell, you can also add new columns, update the layout of your table, uh, provided the updates you want to do is compatible with what you already did. Now I can actually add more data to this table. Uh, so one way to observe what you have in your table is doing scans or gets. Um, so here, if I'm scanning my table, uh, I'll not find anything because there is nothing in there. Right, so that's what I see here. So now I'll actually put one cell in there. the quoting that happens here is mostly because we're inputting and outputting JSON values and JSON requires quotes. So sometimes it's getting a little bit obnoxious when you work in the shell and you're trying to write JSON things because the shell automatically removes all the quoting. Um, <clears throat> so I just wrote one cell. So if I scan back, I should be able to find that cell. Okay, so that's what I see here. Uh, in the entity ID name Christoph.Tanton, uh, at that time stamp, I have one cell that's named info name and the cell value is Christoph. Um, the same way I can write an email. scan and I find my two cells. I can write the same cell again and say my mail has changed. <coughs> that means I will actually overwrite the cell or actually you're not really overwriting, you're just writing a new cell with a newer timestamp uh, and the previous cell is still there. So if I scan back, I'll just find the, the newest version but I can actually also look at the history. Then I can see my former email address, and uh, the former is here, and the newer is here. Um, <clears throat> there is a bunch of other comments. Um, typically, you can you can use Kiji produce to run a producer, map produce to run an arbitrary map produce, uh, delete to delete a row or a cell or a table or an instance. Um, you can increment counters. Uh, counters are actually a specific type that is managed by HBase itself. Uh, it's surfaced in the Kiji API as well. Um, what else? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, so what happens if, in your example, yep. what happens if you change schema? You already said you have schema evolution. You change schema between your original version 
Right. So what happens is we will check that the new schema you're trying to apply to your table is compatible with the current one you have. There's a lot of work being done right now to make this validation more uh, useful. Uh, that's joint work also with Rich Elevens, uh, with Scott Carre, uh, who is actually leading Avro. Um, based on the requirements you have for forward compatibility or backward compatibility, uh, there are a couple of operations you might not be able to do. Uh, typically, if you want to add new fields to a record, it's usually fine provided you do, those fields are actually optional because you can always read older records and that means if they're optional, you don't necessarily need them to work on the data. Uh, so this, this is the kind of thing that happened. Uh, that means we check, if you're adding a new column, there's no problem. If you're deleting a column, there is actually, it's up to you to make sure that you're not actually deleting a column you require. Like there's not much we can do here. Like you're, you're the user for the data. If you're modifying the, the type of a column, all we can do for you is check that the new data that, that you're trying to apply is compatible, that means you will be able to read all data types and write new data, new data types. Um, typically, one example is if you have a, a bunch of servers that actually still use the old data type from the column and you write new data, data types, um, the old server should probably still be able to decode the new data types as well, even though they're not aware of the new data types yet. Um, that means you cannot necessarily add new data uh, without taking this into account. Really? Yep. So how, how are the jobs managed? Can you repeat that? How are the different jobs managed on the cluster? When you go and spin all these TV, you have jobs and stuff, and you give us jobs too. Is it, who's doing the job The job? Uh, there is a map. So the assumption is you have a MapReduce cluster joint with this. And hopefully the task, the task trackers will run alongside with the region servers so that the tasks can be actually collocated with the region servers that you want to run your task with. Um, that's the assumption, right? Uh, the, the entire infrastructure stack is basically Hadoop HDFS, Hadoop MapReduce, HBase region servers. And on top of this, we have just a thin layer that is providing more safety around data management. Uh, and on top of this, we have like the library of MapReduce programs that you can run. Yes. Right now, yes. Uh, right now, we are on CKH412, if I remember correctly. We have some work to use MapR as well. And I think we had some work to be able to work on how it works, but I'm not, I'm not aware of all of these details yet. So for a scan, if you get a table reader, from the table reader you can get a scanner. And for the scanner, all you have to provide is the data request that tells which columns you're actually interested in and how much you want from each column, how many version of each cell. And you have to provide the row scanner options, which include potentially a start key and a limit key or end key. And optionally, you can provide filters. And if you give me less, I can give you a row key scanner, a row scanner. Uh, I don't know if you can read this, but in the table reader, you can do a get scanner here. Uh, in the same way you can do a get, you can do a get scanner. And from the scanner, basically, it's a stream of rows. And so you can iterate over all of the rows you want to read from. That's what we use internally to implement the QG table input format. When you run MapReduces, we're using the scanner. 